Good morning and welcome to our morning service. And it's going to be a special day for us because not only are you going to be able to hear this online, but also that some people will be here in person in the church for the very first time. And we do welcome them in the name of the Lord. The psalmist says these wonderful words in Psalm 98. O Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies. You silence the enemy and the avenger. And when I consider the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you think about him? Or the son of man that you visit him? You've made him a little lower than the angels, yet you've crowned him with honour and glory. You've made him to have dominion over all the works of your hand. And you'll put all things under his feet. O oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Welcome, let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for this beautiful picture it gives us of our world. O Lord, our world which is in chaos and confusion, yet at the same time we see the hand of God just moving on in its beauty and its wonder and its majesty. As we meet around your word this morning, as we meet to worship you, may we sense your presence and your power of your spirit rebuilding our broken lives, giving us strength to face tomorrow and that wonderful assurance of that place that you have promised to those who love you and believe in you and know that forgiveness of sins. Bless you, Lord, from our hearts this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a teenager, uh, we used to go for a holiday down to Clevedon, to a place called Lady Bay. It was not a romantic beach with lovely sand. It was full of pebbles and lots of driftwood. But we used to spend hours down on this beach in the Bristol Channel. We would find old tin cans and we would set them up on rocks and we would spend hour after hour just throwing stones at these tin cans. And I wonder what it is in us that makes us want to knock something down or to try our skills at things like this. You know, we invent games like that. We have a game here called bowls. You have different colored balls like this. You can play them on the grass, in the beach, and you have a little small black one like that. And there you are. And you throw the black one away and then you toss the red one and to see how near you can get. And it's even more fun if you can knock the other person out of the way and their ball goes farther back and you win. You know, there are other games of bowls, and this is another game of bowls. This one here, there you are, you can see the game of bowls there, and it's made play with men, usually in white, and they have a black ball. The other one is bowls, it's sort of a French name for it, but this is the English name for bowls. But whether it's that, or whether it actually is 10 pin bowling, it's all about trying to knock the other ones over and to win. But the interesting thing about the game of bowls itself, is a ball they use is different. It's an awkward sort of ball because you can see there's a spot on the side of the ball. And that is a heavy weight that's on one side of the ball. And as you roll it towards the little white jack, as they call it, then the ball will just turn because the weight pulls it to one way. It has what they call a bias. And doesn't matter how straight you try and make that ball roll, in the end it will turn in one direction only. To the side that the weight is. And this morning we're going to be thinking about something very similar. We're going to think about the weight of sin that so easily uh, surrounds us and gives us that tendency to do what is wrong instead of what is right. We have that, as they say, that bent towards what's doing wrong. One never has to train a child to do wrong, you train a child to do right. Because naturally, because our sinful nature, we turn towards sin. And we're going to be looking at John, 1 John chapter 2 this morning, and we should be studying those verses and reminding us of these words. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anybody loves the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. And it reminds us that the world has kind of an attraction for us that draws us away from God and towards our own sinful tendencies. And that's what we should be looking at this morning. We're going to um, read from the Word of God now. We're going to read 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to pick up a few verses there from 15 down to the end of the chapter, 
which is verse 29. And I want to think with you this morning under four different headings. Uh, last week we, we looked at the way in which we should test ourselves to make sure that we knew him and to, and to realise we have an advocate with the Father that forgives all our sins and covers us. And we have to examine ourselves spiritually and socially to make sure that we're a Christian. There is one more test I want to apply this morning and it's called the secular test. What is your relationship with God this morning? What is your relationship with the world? And how easily the world can hold on to you uh, against all this. The story is told of a ship that caught, was caught in a bad storm and it was in terrible trouble. The engines had failed. She was taken in water. And alas, the captain that sends out the distress signals, the mayday signals, but nobody is coming. They lower the lifeboat over the side of the boat and the, the crew and the passengers get into the lifeboats. There's one man who runs away from the lifeboat and he smashes open the cabin door with an axe. And he has been told that there was gold in there. And there was some gold in there, quite a few heavy bars of gold. And he put them in his pocket and he went to the ship to leave. By this time, the ship was almost going down into the ocean. And as he leapt, the gap between the lifeboat and the ship opened up and he missed the lifeboat by just a couple of feet and he went down into the ocean. And because of all the gold and the stuff he had put into his pockets, he went down and somewhere at the bottom of the ocean is the skeleton now of the man whose pockets were full of gold. My friends, this morning, what are you really holding on to? How firm is your faith? How strong is it? You know, there's a lovely old hymn which says these words, I'd sooner have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd sooner have Jesus than riches untold. And to be the richness of this great realm, really, all these things I'd sooner have. We say it in theory, but in practice this morning, what are you holding on to? What am I holding on to in our Christian life? Are there things we should let go? Are there things that slow us up in the Christian race? The reminder of the road of the Hebrew says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that easily ensnares us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. And so this morning, I want to look at these verses which we have before us. And the first thing I want to know, read to you this morning, is four headings. You know the tendencies. We've all got tendencies to do certain things. And so often we can be taken up with other things. In my car, I have a lane control. There's only a little light. And as I'm driving down the motorway, or even a, an ordinary carriageway, the little light stays green. But as soon as I'm distracted, or as soon as I lose my attention, uh, and the, the car wanders over the white line, or over the near side line, it starts rumbling and the steering wheel shakes in my hand and it reminds me of the tendency to be distracted by things and to move aside. Let's hear the verses that we're going to consider this morning, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anybody loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he that does the will of God abides forever. There's a lovely hymn which we sing sometimes. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to things above. And there's a line in it that says, Look, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it from your courts above. This morning, the tendency to love the world and to cling to the things of this world are inbuilt within each one of us. But you know, there came a time in Jesus' ministry. It was the last miracle I suppose he did on this earth. And he's on the seaside, the beach, of the Sea of Galilee. It has been a hard night for Peter and his friends as they've gone fishing and caught nothing. And at last, Jesus shows them where to find the miraculous cache of fish. 
And Peter pulls them all to shore. And he counts up how many fish there were. Large fish. And the first words Jesus said to Peter. Do you love me more than these? I wonder what was implied. Was it running through Peter's mind that this magnificent haul of fish would fest, fest, fetch top price in the market that day? I don't know. But Jesus asked us the same question this morning. Do you really love me? Do you love me more than this? And it's a question that only you can answer and only I can answer. And to acknowledge that the world does have things we all hanker after. Even Christians. Hebrews 11, Moses makes that choice which we read about in Genesis. Where he chose rather to suffer affliction with the children of God. But to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. When he was looking forward to the reward. And my friends, we have to realise the world is very subtle. And it's not as easy as all that to walk out on the things of this world. We're not called to be hermits or monks. But we're called to live for Christ in this world. We're going through a phase where we're pulling down monuments that we don't think are right. In history, people have done things which have not been right. And we've raised monuments to men who have done great achievements. Yet at the same time, it doesn't fit with the 21st century. And I just wonder, I think the most shameful monument that's ever been erected is the monument of humanism. And yet still that is idolised and held up as being great and good. And I go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. And I see that Adam and Eve gambled on their future. And they thought that they could, they could get what they wanted. And the devil really basically said, as God really said. And they didn't answer the question. And he went on to show them that he could give them all they desired in this world. And they went for it. And they lost everything. And that sad, sad monument has been followed down through the world's history. From the Tower of Babel to the Tower of Absalom. And still today, as people erect their towers, that they say will give them what they want. Yet there's one monument that's despised the day as it ever has been. And it's the monument of Jesus Christ, the cross. Genesis 3, 16 is embarrassment. But Genesis John 3, 16 is everlasting life. And whoever believes on me, says Jesus, will have everlasting life. There are three things in these verses which are important this morning. Do not love the world or the things of the world. And that is attraction. And the world is an attractive place. God has made it attractive. But the devil has used this beauty of this earth to give us our desires which never satisfy. The second thing in verse 16 is not only the attraction but the distraction. Verse 16. And it reminds us that our eyes and our ears are the things that lead us so often to want these things we don't have. The advertising industry, in our televisions and on our magazines, everywhere we're faced with offers of this, that and the other. Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, you can get meals half price just to get people to try and have the meals. It's, it, it, we do fall for these offers when we think that if we have these offers we shall have what we want. But listen to the words. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, it's from this world. And yet God holds out to you and me this morning the most amazing offer this world has ever had. Come unto me, O you that are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He opens wide his arms on the cross and he forgives our sins. And he offers us everlasting life. The world can't come near it. Because of this the subtraction in the third verse, or 70, is so stark, and yet we miss this one every time. The world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. There's the attraction. There's the distractions of the world. But let's never forget the subtractions. All the world calls good and great can never satisfy you and me. It can never give us peace in our hearts. And all the money in the world cannot buy us happiness. And Jesus says, what will man give in exchange 
before his soul. And we think of how tragic and sad that many people have gone to a lost eternity because they have clung to the things of this world and turned their back on Jesus. John 6, 30, 63. Jesus had been teaching the crowds and it got to the stage where some of these people began to walk away from Jesus one by one. And his congregation dwindled from hundreds down to just a handful. And he looked at his disciples and he asked this question, are you also going to go away? And Peter gives an amazing, this one about Peter, he always comes up with the answer straight away. He doesn't always get it right and this one he was bang on. And he said, you have the, you are the son of the living God and you have the words of eternal life. To whom else can we come? And I leave that thought with you to ponder. You see, the secular test is very important. That we analyse where we are and how we are living. What we watch and the things we do and the places we go to. And the way we handle situations in life. Do we handle it like the world? Or do we handle it like a child of God? Secondly, in this section we're looking at this morning, we not only have the secular test, you know, that you know the tendencies. But the second thing, verses 18 to 19, is that you know the times. Before we went down to Western Supermare a few weeks ago, I looked in the Western Daily Press to find out what time the tide was. So I hadn't seen the sea in at Western Supermare for years. And I was really a happy man. Because tide was going to begin at 10 minutes past 4. And I wanted to be still on the beach at 10 minutes past 4 to watch the high tide at Weston. But you know the Bible has a lot about times too. Our times are in his hands. And there's time for everything in life. A time to live and a time to die. But to know the times. What are we talking about here? Listen, little children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even though Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is that last hour. They went out from us. Well, they were not really of us. They didn't belong. For if they had been of us, they would not have, they would have continued to know. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing one from the Holy One, and you know all things. You see, in our world today, and in the last 2,000 years, we've been living in a thing called the end times. It's the gospel hour. It's the gospel era. And the Bible is not specific about days and minutes like we think of it. But it reminds us there that the last hour has come. And you have heard that Antichrist is coming. In fact, Antichrist is here. If we're struggling with anti-Christian ideals today, they were in the first century. And the reason that John is writing this letter is firstly to make sure that believers, Christians, have an idea of where they, who they belong to and where they're going. And to equip them to stand against the onslaughts of the evil one, the deceptions that were happening. They were saying things like, Jesus wasn't really the Son of God. He took on God's role when he was baptised. They were saying things about the resurrection didn't really matter. And it didn't work anyway. And there was Paul struggling with them. There was John struggling with them. And Peter too. And reminding us all the time that we live in those last hours. And the interesting thing is, and it's a very sad verse 19, that there are certain people that will walk away from the gospel today. They may be in your high streets, but they could be in your church. People who have done the right things and gone to the right places, but some other heart has never been changed. And you know, Paul writing to young Timothy says these words, that everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The Lord knows those who are his, and he does. And the evidence of those who walk away from the gospel and turn back to this world in verse 19 is that they've gone out from us but they never really belong to us so that it might be made manifest that we may understand they didn't belong to us I believe it's right and it's biblical that we don't give up on people I'm working in prison for so many years I can't give up on these men but at the same time there are times when people just walk out on God and I can think of a man not living too far from here. 
who for many years walked with God, even worshipped regularly in church. And he even stood up in God's name. And the world has had such a lovely appeal to him, a wonderful appeal. It seems to offer him all he wants in his lifestyle. And he's now just walked away from it all. And he's left. It's so sad, isn't it? But the reminder of the Bible is that you know the times. And Jesus was talking about these end times in Matthew's Gospel. Reminding us that the day of the Lord was coming. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter doesn't mince his words. The day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night. When everybody says peace and safety and all is well. Then suddenly he will come. And it's going to be a traumatic day when the world should be dissolved in fire. All everybody will be judged on that final day. Let's never forget, we're living in those end times. We've only got to look at our world situation. It's what we call unprecedented times. We've never seen a day like this. We've seen weather patterns we've never seen before. We've seen economy going to pieces right across the world. We've seen refugees swarming like ants all over the globe, trying to get to our country as if this was the utopia, this was the heaven that they're wanting for. 579 have crossed from Christmas until now across the channel. My friends, why is this happening? And then we've got a pandemic that's sweeping the world. We have no answers to this. And Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 25 that there will be wars and rumours of wars. There'll be earthquakes in many places. A nation arise against nations. We live in these days. And all the more reason why we should make sure that our faith is right in Christ. You know the tendency. You know the times. The verse 20 to 23 reminds us that you know the truth. You know the truth. You have an anointing one, the Holy One, and you know all things. And I've written these, I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know the truth. And there's no lie of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, and he denies the Father and the Son. And whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father too. Sometimes you wonder why the Bible writes very simple things over to us again. And I think of that lovely old hymn, Tell Me the Old, Old Story of Jesus and His Love. And one of the verses says this, Tell me the story slowly that I may take it in. The early dew of morning has passed away at noon. And I forgot what it really means to me. And because of our tendency to forget and to, to relax in this world, Peter, John takes this up again. He says, you have an anointing from the Holy One. You know these things. You know that you've been born again. He's gone through chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2, telling us what we do know. And it's an amazing privilege to be a child of God rather than a son of this world. So I'm not writing you anything new, he's saying. And I've not written to you because you do not know the truth. Because you do know it. And he emphasises that there is no lie in truth. God cannot lie. And his word doesn't lie. And what his word speaks to us today is truth. And honesty. And power and authority. And reminds us that the reason for doing this is to remind you that there, you and I have to battle against Antichrist. And who is a liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? And the first step towards this Gnosticism, which Paul, uh, John was wrestling against, well, and Paul at the same time, and Peter, they were all struggling with this. They denied that Jesus was the Son of God. They don't accept this. They crucified the Lord of life and glory. Had they known it, they wouldn't have done it. And this is the reason he writes. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. And whoever denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. But he who acknowledges the Son has the Father too. You've heard my story of Ivan, who used to live in Gypsy Lane. Hard man all his life. Bitter man. But having been very, very ill with heart attacks. I went and spent some time with him and we read a small testament together. And Ivan came to faith in Christ. 
this hard, gambling, bitter man. I thought, nothing could ever change that rock of a man. And one winter morning at half past seven, he phoned up to me. And he said, Jim, he said, I've been talking to him. I said, talking to who, Ivan? He said, I've been talking to Jesus. I didn't get on too well with God, but I felt safe with Jesus. And my heart just welled up in me as I thought of the Spirit of God changing this man. I felt safe with Jesus. What a lovely thought. Safe in the arms of Jesus. Yeah. And do you know where he is now? He's in heaven. Safe in the arms of Jesus. And Jesus said, who has seen me has seen the Father. Yeah, and this simple faith of this man was such a testimony that is witness. Yeah. Paul says to Timothy 1 verse 12, I know and I've believed and I'm persuaded he's able to keep what I've committed to that day. And finally this morning, not only do you know uh, the tendencies, you also know the times, you know the truth, but also you know the test. You see, why is he doing this? Well, he's doing it to test you and me. And he reminds us in those last of those verses 24 to 27 there. Therefore, let that abide in you which you've heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning stays in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he's promised us, eternal life. These things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. You do not need that anyone teaches you. But as the same anointed teaches you concerning everything, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has been taught you, you will abide in him. If the going gets tough, then the tough get going. But brother, sister, this morning, hang on in there. We will win. I've read the last pages. Jesus reminds us in John chapter 8, 36, that the truth will set you free. The devil tempts, God tests. But the reason he does this is to strengthen your faith and mine. And he reminds us, therefore, to abide in him as I abide in you. This is what John te Jesus teaches in John's Gospel uh, about the vine. Abide in me and I in you. And if you don't abide in me, then you will not bring forth fruit. And he prunes the branches and he produces a better vine. And you and I are part of the vine. He is the root. And we depend upon him for everything. Without him we can do nothing. And we have this anointing. That's a lovely picture. The anointing which you have received from him abides in you. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The assurance that your sins have been forgiven. And you have peace with God. And I'll tell you what, he gives us a promise that he's never backed down on yet. And has never failed. He's promised us eternal life. What a lovely position, isn't it, to be in? Once again, you know, we have to analyse these things in John's letter. We have to listen to John's heart as he writes this letter. And he's reminding us not to love this world. You know the tendency to love things around us. But you also know the times in which we live. We don't need to tell you the traumatic days in which we live when men's hearts are failing. And you also know the test too. The test, the litmus test to know whether you are a son of God. Whoever believes in me has everlasting life. And you know to the authority. Finally, verses 28 to 29. Now, little children, abide in him. And when he appears, you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And you may know that he is righteous. And you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. I just want to leave this simple thought with you. He talks to children, little children. John refers to his followers, and he's now an elderly man as his little children. He's not treating you like kids, but he's treating you in a wonderful way. You see, the word little children is a word that comes from the Greek, and we get from it the word bairns. If you live in Scotland, very often a little baby will be called a wee bairn, a wee bairn. And it's a turn of endearment. This is a child that is very precious and very special. And also from that in scripture we learn that we are even taught as children how to address our Heavenly Father. 
and to call him Abba, Daddy. What a beautiful picture. And John wants the simplicity of these little children. Just, just, just stay with Jesus. Just abide in him as he abides in us. And I love Paul's words in Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. My friends, does that lift your heart this morning? Does it keep you moving on? What are you listening to? The music, the rhythm of this world. Or are you listening to those angelic voices in glory? Just welcoming you home at the end of your journey. It's not imagination. It's revelation. We live in a day where men let their imagination run wild. And they say all sorts of crazy things about what science discovers for them. The long-tailed tit. Oh, it took the took the scientists years to work out why long-tailed tits go around in little circles and don't cross the boundaries with one another. But my God has put this infinitely in those little birds' brains. And he says to you and to me, you're more valuable than any sparrows. And so this morning, just think of how precious you are in God's sight. And he left the realms of glory for you. Maybe you've never recognised him that yet. And this God seems so distant and so out of reach. And he was for Ivan for much of his life. But there came a time when he realised that Jesus was all he needed. He was the way, the truth and the life. And Jesus said, whoever believes on me has everlasting life. And whoever doesn't, the wrath of God remains upon him. May God bless you all.